All right. So welcome officially to our HEAA reunion day. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for coming in person. I know many of you traveled from far and wide to attend on campus. And we have several hundred of our fellow community members on Zoom. So welcome to all of you. Now, my name is Jill Felicio. I know I've met some of you before. And, and I'm delighted to meet the rest of you today. And we have lots of time to chat. And I am a member of Harvard Extension School's classes of 2000 with an ALB and 2013 with my ALM. I'm also now a Director of Advancement here at Harvard's Division of Continuing Ed for the past seven years. So it's, it's just my privilege to be able to be here with all of you and meet thousands and thousands of you on the road. So it's a day that we get to come together, this reunion day, to celebrate and remember our time at Harvard, which if your time was anything like mine, it was life-changing and unforgettable. So it's you know really just spectacular to be on this beautiful campus together. So I think there's forever the magic of being back in person that still exists for me, and I hope it exists for you. But essentially, it's been just a fabulous year for the HEAA, and today's event kicks off the best time of year here on campus, honestly, which is commencement week. And we are welcoming over 1,400 new graduates to our association. <laughs> Woo! So I know a number of you are in the room today. And if you don't mind, if just raise your hand. And if you're on Zoom, raise your hand. Woo! Amazing. <laughs> My goodness. Congratulations. And you know, honestly, it's a bittersweet moment. Thursday looks like sun. <laughs> it does. It looks good. It doesn't look like rain now. <laughs> That's OK. That's the important thing. As long as there's no rain. But generally, we'll take some sun. Uh, but generally, that day is such a spectacular day. And, and those of us in this room that have already had that day will never forget it. So you know, honestly, I think. There's so much to remember and celebrate during this week. And we have a banquet coming up, which some of you may be attending. We have receptions this year that are new for graduates, which will be very exciting. And the big day on Thursday. So we're really just getting started. And then when you all leave and go home, we get very sad. So it's really nice to have you. And generally, I want to give a shout out. We had a, we had a spectacular election for our board of directors this past month. So thank you to each of you who voted. It was an unprecedented turnout. We're incredibly proud of our newly elected cohort, who will be led by our president, Ariel Gamino. Ariel, here in the room. Ariel has been with us as a volunteer for the past seven years, doing just incredible things. And I want to also give a shout out to our board members, many of whom are actually leaving us this May. But essentially, I want to give a shout out to Connie Askin. Connie, if you don't mind. Hey, Connie. Connie is our director of development. OK, Sol. Sol Gerard. <laughs> thank you, Sol. Our amazing vice president, thank you for your service. Heather, where is my Heather Friedman? <laughs> Heather Friedman, fabulous director of regional engagement for the HEAA, a, a portion of our engagement effort that we're really proud of. We have chapters around the world that support our community in city. And we have members of our Latin America chapter who traveled together to come today. So. Thank you for coming. We have a spectacular day today where we are going to hear from one of the most renowned, exciting, and well-reviewed uh, faculty in our school's history, and just a compelling presentation. And now we have our dean, Suzanne Spreadbury, also here. There she is. <laughs> and Dean Spreadbury and Dean Coleman, who you'll meet in a moment, are taking this school in directions unimaginable. And we're so excited to see the impact that our Dean Nancy will have as we move forward in building our alumni network. Now, we have 
to these members of the class of 23. You're joining the Harvard Extension Alumni Association, which is 40,000 members all over the world, but also the Harvard Alumni Association with almost 500,000 people around the world. So there's always a way to get engaged. And Dean Coleman, who you'll meet in a moment, is with us in her third year. And she has been just incredible in getting out to meet our community around the world. So I know she's every bit as delighted as I am to welcome you. She has been a leader in the higher education industry. And generally, I'm going to reference my notes, because in her time before Harvard, she was the associate provost and the founding director of strategic growth initiatives at Wellesley College. And she has formally served as a vice president of Key Path Education, as well as the director of distance education for Boston University. So she's brought all of that talent and skill and the experience of having been a lifetime learner herself to this helm. And I can say the same for Suzanne, who brings every ounce of energy and support to all that we do and all that we will do in the future. So with that, Nancy Coleman. Well done. Thank you, Jill, and welcome, everybody. Good morning. It is so thrilling to see you all here and kick off commencement week. We have an incredible slate of events for you, so hopefully some of you can stay for the whole week, but whatever component of the week that you can stay for, we're really thrilled to have you with us today. So I did something, I actually prepared my remarks, which I usually go a little off the cuff, and Jill just stole half of them, so I... <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to be a little off the cuff and a little and, and a little um, and and a little uh, scripted. So um, first of all, this is such an incredible opportunity for you all to connect and reconnect with your classmates, with people who have shared experience with you, and we hope that you'll spend your time today or throughout the week if you're here to um, to really make new friends, reconnect with old, and really just enjoy yourself. As Jill said, this is my third year, my second HEAA reunion. And over the past year, I really had the privilege of traveling with Jill. Basically, Jill says, hey, Nancy, show up in this place on this day, and I do. So thank you, Jill. But I've been able to really talk to so many of our alums. And the themes, and I've, I've really heard a lot, and um, both in the US and abroad. And it's such a pleasure to speak with you all, because you're so eager to share your stories with us. And we hear about the hard work, the long nights, and the sacrifices that students have made during their degree program with us. And that is very quickly followed by, and it's all been worth it, because my experience was transformative, the, the degree that I earned from Harvard has changed my life, and I've been able to go forth and do amazing things in the world with that degree. So please, share your stories with us. We love to hear them. We love to hear about the work that our students and alumni are doing. And um, please, at any point, stop any one of us and share, and share, with you, share what, what you're doing. Um, I'll also say that in addition to Dean Spreadbury, who I was going to introduce, I'd like to introduce you to the director of our management and business programs, Laura Wilcox. And we also have the assistant director of management programs, Lynn Larson, who was one of our alums. Welcome, 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 Dean Spreadbury. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the incredible work that Jill and her advancement team have done to prepare not only for this event, but for our entire week. So let's give a hearty round of applause. I'm not sure how much sleep they've had over the past weeks, but you know, we, we can sleep on Friday, I think, is, uh, is, is, is the goal. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our incredible faculty speaker. And for many of you, he needs no introduction whatsoever because he's one of our most beloved faculty members. A true embodiment of the Harvard Extension School spirit, Teo Nicolai is a real estate entrepreneur who loves to teach. Professor Nicolai has taught over 100 courses at the Extension School in the Division of Continuing Education. And he's had a cumulative enrollment of over 14,000 students, which is incredible. To date, over 6,000 Harvard students in general have taken his real estate courses. And semester after semester, he earns top, top marks on all of his course evaluations. He's also the recipient of multiple teaching, service, and HESA student service awards. 
Uh, Nikolai graduated from Harvard College with a bachelor's in economics and from MIT with a master of science in real estate development. He studied real estate private equity at Harvard Business School and advanced real estate finance development and private equity at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. His career is a distinguished one. In addition to leading his own real estate investment company, he's been hired by the FTC as an expert witness in real estate matters and as a real estate subject matter expert by Harvard Business School Online. He also sits on a variety of boards of directors and continues to serve his profession with his time and expertise on a wide variety of prestigious professional associations. So please join me in welcoming Professor Teo Nikolai. Thank you so much. I appreciate thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Uh, it is uh, one of the things that each of you who has traveled here, uh, either if it's your first time or multiple times for a reunion, uh, will find is that when you come back, that special feeling that happens when you come to a place, a, a point on this earth that you know truly is your home. Um, that is certainly is my experience, and being here with, uh, with my family is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a feeling that I am very, very thankful for. So I want to thank you. Uh, I want to, of course, thank Jill uh, for, for inviting me to, uh, to be a part of this and your whole team. Uh, and and I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that we have uh, in, in the front um, a, a group of people, uh, Suzanne and Laura and Lynn, uh, who have been champions um, of this program. They have been champions of you, and they are champions of the entire Harvard community, and I appreciate that. Uh, so again, I want to. I know we've already given the round of applause, but please help me in that again. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. Um, it, they know this because I I, I I tell the story a lot. Um, but those those classes that you heard about, those real estate classes, the classes that has been my absolute pleasure to teach and honor to be a part of, uh, they all started over a, a napkin and a, and a bowl of soup at the, at the Charles Hotel. Uh, it, was, it was Laura and, and Suzanne and I were sitting down around the table thinking about uh, new ways that we can help the Harvard community. And it was at that meeting over that bowl of soup that we sketched out the idea of, of, of a real estate class. And of course, with the students' help and your support, uh, that one class turned into many. And the, the handful of students that enrolled in that, that very first time has now reached, again, over 6,000 students. Um, that is the type of thing that happens when you are part of this community. That happened to be the case for just the class here. But I like to think that happens everywhere that Harvard Extension School touches. In all of our lives, we experience that one spark, that one moment, and our lives are forever changed there, uh, from there, that, that point forward. So let's talk about, uh, speaking of, of, of things that start on a napkin or perhaps things that start on a piece of paper, uh, I want to talk to you today, and it is my honor to be here, uh, to talk about uh, three things that I think are forever changing, the way that our cities work. And for those of you who have taken my real estate classes know, uh, it's not just cities. Cities are people. And so it's really about three things that are changing all of our lives. So on that idea uh, of something that started on a napkin or a piece of paper, I want to set the stage by thinking about uh, what exponential growth really means. Because we are really good at a lot of things. Our minds are incredible in terms of, of, the, of being able to grasp new facts and being able to think about new ideas. And yet, when it comes to exponential growth, it turns out we are exceptionally bad at thinking about this. So, uh, so if you happen to have one, so join me on this. If you happen to have a piece of paper, go ahead and grab a piece of paper. Uh, this is a, an exercise for us to think about what exponential growth really means, because it requires a different way of thinking. So we have, uh, you're all familiar with this device, uh, the Gen, Gen Z less so, but, but, but you've seen this device before. Um, so this is something that's familiar to us. Uh, the weight, the thickness, the size of this piece of paper, this is something uh, that, is, that we're all familiar with. So we should be able to understand how this might change over time. So let's do something really, really simple. Take that piece of paper you're so familiar with and go ahead and fold it in half, just one time. How much, how much thicker is that? Not a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, it ba barely perceptible. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if I even had a ruler I could measure that. Let's go ahead and take that piece of paper. Let's fold it one more time. 
right? Just two folds. Here we go. How about that? Look at that thickness of that piece of paper now that you folded it, uh, not once but twice. Fold it one more time for me, three times. How thick do we think we see it? Okay, we're starting to see a little bit of change here, right? It's, it's it may, perhaps even measurable. Um, I, I, by the way, I have measured this. This is about, uh, about just, just about uh, 0.5 uh, inches or 0 0.05, one uh, twentieth of an inch is where we're at. What if you continued that? What if you folded it not once, not twice, not three times. Uh, what if you folded it, let's say, 14 times? I promise that I wouldn't have any quizzes in this class, so I'm just going to have you have a mental image of what you think uh, of, of folding this 14 times. Just take a moment, though. Look at what you've got in your hand. This thing you're so familiar with, as we've already now folded a couple times, 14 times. What, in your mind, where do we think that is? Do we think it's maybe a foot, right? Maybe six inches? Right? I'm hearing some head shaking. No, it's, a, it's about five, five and a half feet. Right? You fold a piece of paper. By the way, I've done the math. I had to double check on this. Yes, yes. So you fold that. So, so if we did this 14 times, we're now at five and a half feet. That one piece of paper, that one idea, that one moment has now become something much, much larger. We're at the extension school. Let's go a little bit bigger. What if you continued folding? You folded it not 14 times, but 21 times. Now, again, this is actually, you know, this isn't a big change here. We're going from 14 to 21. So just go ahead and just imagine in your mind taking that piece of paper and imagine folding it another, uh, another seven times, 15, and then we could fold it 16 times, and then 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. In your mind, where are we at? How tall is this piece of paper or this stack of paper that you have? Someone said Empire State Building. Very close. Just about the, t the, the height of the John Hancock Tower. That's you take that one piece of paper you had, you fold it 21 times, you are now at the height of the John Hancock Tower. Uh, that's 790 feet. We're actually a little bit lower than that, 699. Um, maybe we need a couple more pieces of paper on top of that. Continue that effort. Do what we do at the Extension School all the time, which is take an idea and run with it. What if you folded it, not 21 times, but, but 42 times? By the way, I love the ambition of this group. <laughs> it is to the moon. It's not just to the moon, it's past the moon, right? That, it is insane, right? And the thing is, this is what geometric growth looks like. That's why when we take this one piece of paper, this one idea, uh, one piece of paper may simply be the, the napkin we had, it may be the diploma that many of you are receiving today. Take that one piece of paper, and exponentiate it, and you run into the, the world or the universe of possibilities. And it is that universe of possibilities that I really want to talk to you guys about today. So we're going to talk, by the way, in terms of the, I, we, the teaching staff and I, we, we talk a lot about this stuff. So we're doing this math as to how long it would take to get across the solar system and all that. Um, that's the kind of dreaming I hope uh, all of you enjoy. I certainly do with all of you. But let's talk about two major trends, and then again, I'm going to tie them together at the end for a third. Uh, the first trend I want to talk about is longevity. Um, this is one of those things that uh, people ask, you know, what, what keeps you up at night? Um, this keeps me up at night in terms of thinking about the possibility that lays before us that we have not seen in the entire length of human history until this generation, longevity. We're going to talk about that. We're also, of course, going to talk about technology. Uh, technology is revolutionizing uh, our world, of course. Uh, it's revolutionizing real estate, so we'll talk about that. Uh, but we'll also, of course, talk about artificial intelligence uh, and how that is, is leading to this exponential growth. So let's talk about this, uh, this whole thing of longevity. Uh, the Economist, uh, the, uh, one of my favorite magazines of all time, uh, says that longevity is one of humanity's greatest accomplishments. Uh, there's a wonderful book about this. Joseph, uh, Joseph uh, Claflin uh, over, over at MIT notes that aging, uh, the aging uh, populations represents the most profound change that is guaranteed to come to high-income countries everywhere and most low-income countries as well. Right? This is one of those things. Again, what, the, the, what, what Joseph says, he says, he says uh, demographics is destiny. 
So we can make a lot of predictions. And, and Nancy and I were talking earlier about how you know, sometimes you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. This we know is going to happen. And the implications of this are staggering. So let me tell you why I'm excited about uh, longevity, why I think that you all need to know about it, why this keeps me up at night and gets me going in the morning. Uh, first and foremost is we have to realize that people are living longer. So that's really, really important to think about. And again, the, that seems simple, just like folding a piece of paper. But the geometric implications of that are huge. Uh, it's also worth noting that especially women right now are living longer. Uh, and so again, that's had significant impacts in terms of, of our consumer base uh, and the way that our, our whole society is structured. So uh, an important uh, change that we're seeing. Uh, birth rates are decreasing. So again, separate phenomenon. But the confluence of these phenomenons are going to change. I'll show you the, the changes that we're seeing in the world as a result of people living longer and, of course, birth rates decreasing. And then finally, something we've all known about, we've heard about, uh, we, we, it's, it's, it's happening, but baby boomers are, re are reaching the retirement age. Uh, and again, I say retirement age in quotes uh, because I'm not so, sure, sure, I'm not so convinced um, that they should be retiring, uh, not from an economic standpoint, but from a, from a, a yearning and a, and, a, and a social enterprise standpoint. Um, so I have put that in quotes. But let's talk about this idea about uh, people living longer and, and what that means. Uh, so just, just some, some, some kind of, again, the no quiz at the end here. But what we can see here is when we think about people living longer, uh, what we note is over the last, from the 1980s until now, we have added about 10 years onto the average uh, expected lifespan at birth. So again, what you're looking at on the left side, that's for women. Uh, right side's for men. The, the, the US is, of course, the lighter line that we see. Uh, we note South Korea is kind of the most, one of the most dramatic examples. Uh, again, one of the reasons it's worth noting is because we can see before our very eyes change happening in the world around us. So what are the implications of this, uh, of, of, of life expectancy? Well, again, one of the things we note is it does matter where you live. And that, that should give us all pause. Because I think we all know it shouldn't be the case that the country in which you were born, the circumstances under which you were born, should, should play a significant role in how long you get to spend on this earth. Uh, but we know that it does. Also, as we're going to talk about later on, uh, your access to education. Again, it should not matter where you happen to have been born. But we do know that at this moment, that does play a role in terms of the educational opportunities. One of the reasons I am so proud to be part of the Extension School is because the Extension School is breaking down this barrier. And I think it's one of the most, for me, it, it makes me proud to be a part of the Extension School. Uh, and I hopefully for all of you, it will as well. But let's talk about age. Again, in the last, uh, in the last uh, from 2010 to 2030, just in that short period, 2010, not that long ago. It, doesn't feel, it, doesn't, it, it feels like, you know, uh, for some people, long ago. It wasn't that long ago, 2010, we've added about 6% onto the, the expected lifespan of someone who is, who is born. Um, that's, again, about five years. Five years is a lot in terms of our human lifetime. And it's five healthy years that we're adding the possibilities, again, are absolutely immense. So what's going on? Again, what, what's, why are we living longer? Uh, well, again, any, any guesses as to why we're living longer? Right? Yeah, medicine, right? We're, we're, getting our, we, we're doing a lot more in terms of medicine. Uh, we've, we have reduced significantly uh, disease-related death. So uh, again, pick, pick, kind of pick the disease. Uh, this, is, uh, this is heart disease, essentially, is what we're talking about here. We were talking about the, again, I, I, for those who are in the back, uh, in the US, back in the 19, we're talking 1960s, uh, about 400 deaths per 100,000 people on, on any given year uh, for, for heart disease, we're now down to 100. We've cut it, uh, we've cut it by, by 75%. Uh, cancer, we're doing better. Long way to go on cancer. But again, look at the curve that's happening just in the last 10 years alone. And of course, uh, stroke, major, major uh, cause of, of disability and death. Uh, again, just a, a plummeting of stroke-related deaths. This is all in most of our lifetimes. Overall, just general causes of disease-related death. Again, this is on the, on the, so we're seeing on this left-hand side. Uh, what we're talking about is from around, again, call it about 900 uh, deaths per 100,000 people from some sort of preventable disease. Um, we see now we're down to about 200. 
um, or 200 to 300. Right? This is, so we, we have these medical advances. Again, it's a lot of the, the experimentation that's happening uh, right here in Boston. We're seeing a lot of the dividends paying out. These, again, I know it's easy to look at these lines and say, okay, well, so what, that's good. Right? These lines represent people, people who get to walk around and breathe and, and, and experience life. And they get to do it because of the world that we live in today. So that's a big thing. People, we're keeping people alive longer, and that's a really big deal. Another big deal, of course, is birth rates are decreasing. And now this does, again, this is a separate phenomenon. It just so happens they're happening together, and we need to be aware of the consequences of this. Um, so in terms of birth rate, again, uh, this is the, the obligatory kind of spaghetti lines here. Um, here's what you need to take away. What we're talking about is uh, we're talking about the average, uh, the, the average number of, of births uh, per woman. And what we just note is a couple key numbers for you. First and foremost is uh, replacement is 2.1. Okay, that's a, if there's a number I want you to walk away from this, this discussion with, it's 2.1. That is to say, uh, for every woman, in order to keep the, the population stable, uh, we need about 2.1 live births in our population on average. What do you notice on this right-hand side as we hit 2020, as we hit this decade? What's that? Yes, we've dipped quite a bit, and for most countries, we've actually dipped below that. Right? The 2.1 is the replacement rate. Uh, to give you an idea, the US is just above that, uh, but just barely above that. Uh, the, uh, to give you an idea, uh, South Korea is currently at the, at the bottom of the pack. Um, they're 0.84 live births per woman right now. Per, uh, per, and and that's, that's something to be thinking about, because again, that's why we see that significant decrease in, in population. So that whole live births, uh, thing is a big deal for us. You've got a bunch of people who are living longer. You have fewer people coming behind them. The implications of that for our cities and, of course, our lives are huge. Uh, I was giving a, a talk in, in Denmark uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, and, uh, and Denmark is kind of an interesting situation. One of the happiest places on the planet, by the way, I mean, in terms of actually like surveys of human happiness uh, and just, just great people. So uh, it was my pleasure to be out there, and I was pointing out um, their births. This is a slightly different way of looking at this. Uh, what we're talking about here is we're talking about live births uh, per, um, uh, this is per thousand uh, uh, people. So what we're talking about here is this is, uh, again, just different way of looking at the same data. Uh, what we observe is a massive decline from the 19, again, 30s. We're talking about, again, th about 30 or so births per 1,000 people. It plummeted down in the 1980s. It was almost down to about 10. Went up in the early 2000s and plummeted again. Right? This graph this is represent this is this is you would think by the way so they have they have you know great great healthcare system so it's not about health right what we're talking about is decisions uh, people who are putting off uh, giving birth uh, couples who decide not to have children at all right again these are just life choices it's perfectly fine uh, but from an economic standpoint Right, if you think about retirement and how that works, uh, there is kind of a system that we've built wherein retirees are paid for uh, by the people who are following behind them. Uh, families are to be, are the, the, the caretaking is largely responsible or the responsibility of people who are coming uh, behind. So when you have this situation, it can be a big deal. It can be challenging for your workforce. It can be challenging for, uh, for, the, for government spending. And indeed, it was so challenging, and this is absolutely true, uh, the, uh, the Washington Post ran this story, and I checked it out. Uh, they actually had a campaign. This is a real thing. I checked with the people in Denmark. I was there in Copenhagen. Uh, do it for Denmark. <laughs> And, and what it really was looking at was saying, look, uh, we need more Danes. Uh, and they were very, very clear about this. And however they came to be, they needed more Danes. Um, one of the things they found, they did a study, and they said, how can we assist this? And exactly what you want, by the way, is the government you know, getting involved. Uh, so they did. This is absolutely true. Uh, they came up with a, with a marketing campaign because what they found was that the Danes uh, had 46% more uh, sex while they were traveling. So what did they do? They sent them. So this is this whole campaign, uh, Made in New York, Born in Denmark. Uh, so it's you know, for your country, for your people, 
take that vacation, go out, make that trip. 46% more sex had, was being had uh, during vacations. And so these are the kind of government interventions that are going along around the world. I'm going to talk to you about a bunch of different ones that are happening. Um, by the way, I did ask whether or not the people had heard this. They were all familiar with this campaign. And as a matter of fact, uh, one, of the, one of the attendees at the event uh, messaged me afterwards on LinkedIn. He says, I hope you're enjoying your stay. By the way, our oldest daughter is a result of a nice weekend in Stockholm. So you don't even have to go very far. <laughs> but these are the things that people are thinking about because this idea of longevity and lower birth rates has a lot of people thinking about what our future looks like. Um, so uh, that's a big, big deal for us. Uh, another big deal for us, as I mentioned, is uh, baby boomers are, are reaching that retirement age. And again, you all have known this. You've heard about it. We've been, we, again, this goes back to, to Joseph uh, Claflin's uh, point, which is uh, demographics is destiny. We knew from the, from, the, from the decade in which baby boomers were born that this was going to happen. We've had, we've had 40 uh, to 60 years to prepare for this. And what we note is that this was, the baby boomers were the largest generation that there ever was. Uh, and, and note, it was not just that it's a large generation, but it was not followed by a larger generation. Depending on who you ask, by the way, millennials may, may, may be the larger, uh, uh, the, the larger uh, generation. Uh, it depends on the cutoff. But what's, what's absolutely not in question is that we had this huge set of baby boomers. They were followed by a generation which was substantially smaller. And they are now retiring. Uh, 2009, we saw this coming. This is probably where you saw a lot of those articles back when we started to see what are going to happen when the baby boomers start retiring. Uh, we're there now. Right? right now, in terms of retirement age, 65 years old, we're about halfway through in terms of baby boomers retiring. Uh, in fact, a little bit more than that. So what does this mean for, for our economy? Uh, if you have these talented, trained workers leave the economy, what does that do? Well, it puts a lot of stress on the economy. And that's why we see all of these companies. So uh, we've got this, this question of pilot shortages. That is a major problem. Uh, we, we haven't fixed that. Uh, doctors, we have a huge problem. Uh, nursing staff. The, uh, in, in the UK, they talked about early retirement being the biggest cause of later shortage. Uh, we just saw this in, in France, right, where, where when you try to move the retirement age up by like, it was like a, like a, a year, like a half a year or a year or more. Right? And they had riots in the streets. The question is, how do we think about this idea of someone retiring at age 65, taking all that human capital with them, and then hanging out for, we hope, a very long time, another four decades? Right? How do we seize upon that? Because it's not just a personal choice. And again, I don't want to, I, this is being recorded, so I should be very careful. I don't want to say, like, you know, the, we, we need those people not to retire. But what we need is their contribution. We need that human capital. It is not just about uh, the, you know, the experiences we have or going out and having fun and playing golf. It's about the contribution that everyone makes to the global civilization that we have. The one that we have today and the one we hope we will have in the future. And so we have this reservoir that's happening right now. Uh, and so it's something to be thinking about. But there's a lot of economics that we need to be thinking about on this. So again, the key thing I want to emphasize here is it's not just that we have a lot more older people. Right? That's, that's good for a lot of reasons. It's that those older people, that older generation, are making up a significantly larger portion of the overall economy right? and the overall population. Uh, this, again, just one way to show the exact same thing. I won't dwell on it too much, except to say that what we're looking at here is we're looking at the different, uh, this is the, the life, again, the, the overall uh, population. So uh, at the top, what I'm, what I, the point being is that longer life expectancy plus lower birth, birth rate means we have, a, we have an increase in the average age. But we've got these two slices, the 65 to 84 year olds and then above, um, that are now taking a, a larger and larger and larger percentage of our population. Uh, and again, if you notice, the actual, the, the total, th these are absolute numbers, by the way, in the US. Um, the, the actual total number of zero to 17 year olds not changing a lot. Again, you would think with the population that is, that is increasing in size, that number would go up as well. But again, that lower birth rate, we're seeing it in real time. 
And so here we come to the first of the, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, hopefully we'll have time for two breakout sessions, but I want you guys to be thinking about this because this is of course a Harvard classroom. Uh, and so therefore, we, 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 the, the, the learners must be engaged. Uh, I believe that with all my heart. Uh, here is a typical, uh, what we call demographic pyramid. You may have been used to seeing this. Uh, this was in 1960. Uh, and, and again, what we note is there is, it, it should be pretty much a, a, a standard pyramid. Um, the, of course, the cutout in the middle here, this is 1960, 20 years prior. Uh, the world was, of course, engaged in a global conflict. Um, and so that's why we see a little bit of a distortion. But this is what you would typically see. And here's, with the exception of the height of this, this type of pyramid, would be exactly what you'd expect to see in 1900, and in 1800, and in 1500. 2,000 years ago, we would have seen approximately the same general shape. A little bit shorter, of course, but the same general shape. This is what we're seeing uh, by 2060. And again, this is one of those things, it's going to happen. Right? There is not a, there's, not, there's no mechanism by which this will change uh, because 2060, again, not that long ago. Uh, many of you will have your student loans paid off by then, potentially. So, <laughs> so we, you hope. So, so the question now becomes, um, what, do we, what do we do about this? Uh, the, you know, what, what are the opportunities? What are the, uh, what are the, what are the, what are the risks? Uh, let, me, let me give you some, some things to think about in terms of the way that we might think about this. Uh, in in uh, the Japanese government, by the way, so Japan uh, famously right now is struggling with this uh, because Japan has had a very low birth rate for a very long time. Uh, they also do not have their, their immigration policy as such. They don't have a lot of people moving into Japan. So they are actually, this is true, is they're actually paying families to relocate. So if you have a child, and that's the key thing, you can't just, be, it's not a retirement community. If you have a child, they'll actually pay you to move into the countryside. This is so critical that there is a town, this, just, this is an article that just recently came out, there's a town in Tokyo that celebrated a newborn's birth because it was the first one they'd had in 25 years, right? Yeah. So again, if you think about our cities and you think about our, our towns, uh, imagine uh, this situation. Now again, I'd be interested to see what the, like the elementary school looks like there. Uh, but, <laughs> but Japan truly is, uh, is, is, is one example, uh, not the only one, by far and away, not the only one, uh, but I wanna get you, kinda get you thinking about this, about these trends that we're seeing. Um, so uh, what we're seeing again, uh, certainly deaths uh, are, are going up, but again, that's, that's, that's not, this is an act, absolute numbers, by the way. So not surprising, you have a large population, you have people that, that pass. But again, birth rate, we're talking about by 2004, for those of you who are in the back, 2004 is what we're looking at all the way to 2022. So you see this precipitous drop in births, precipitous drop in marriages as people, again, people are experiencing a greater de degree of independence than we've ever had in, our, in, our, in the history of history. And so we're seeing a uh, decline in marriages. Uh, and so even, I'll just note, uh, even China, as we've learned, has experiencing this. India right now uh, has probably the most classic shape of, in terms of a demographic, uh, the de demographic pyramid. Uh, but even China, uh, you all know, China for the first time, uh, for the first time since the 1960s, uh, lost population last year. Right? This is something that's happening in the world around us. And there are exciting possibilities, and there are risks. And it's something we need to be thinking about. So. Uh, Here's what we're gonna do. Again, I promised you guys the, to, uh, to a breakout session. So we're gonna just take about 10 minutes and uh, you can turn to the person next to you or for those of you who are who have joined us Zoom, by the way, hello, good to see all of you. And that's, my, that's my native, uh, by the way, uh, uh, presentation mode is, is in Zoom. So I feel weird being here. Uh, I do have, I'm not just, the, I'm not just from here up. Um, so for those of you who are joining us Zoom, thank you for being here. And there will be breakout rooms for, for all of you. Uh, but we're gonna just take 10, about 10 minutes and I want you to think about two things uh, because there are, uh, I've, I've, I've mentioned to you uh, some things to be concerned about, but there are tremendous opportunities in this shift that we are experiencing. So the first question is what is the biggest opportunity? Second thing is what is the biggest risk? And because of course you guys are part of a group that solves problems, um, what do we do about it? Let's take 10 minutes, turn to your neighbor, and, uh, and we'll, I, I'd like to hear from you guys afterwards. So uh, what are the biggest opportunities? What are the biggest risks? And for those risks, what are we gonna do about it? I'll see you guys in about 10 minutes.
Okay, so uh, heard a lot of, of, of interesting ideas and, and questions. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna start uh, with, the, with the risks. Let's start with that. And then we're gonna talk, we're gonna move our gaze to opportunities. Um, so what are the risks? What are the threats that we have from this, uh, this, this unusual first time in human history change in our demographic pyramid? Yes? So we're gonna have less producers and less consumers. So keeping the cycle of the economy is Got it. So we've got a less. Uh, so we're actually so le less producers, less consumers, uh, and indeed the uh, you know right now we're at about eight billion people in in the in the world. We're seeing a decline in population uh, across the uh, the a, a lot of, of the countries. Uh, Japan, for example, because of that, uh, they've got about 125 million people today. Uh, by 2060, about 80 million is where we think Japan's going to be. Uh, peak population is about third, by the way. So we're talking about of or about a quarter to third of, of the population. Uh, decrease. So that's a huge thing. In the world of real estate, the space market is going to be stressed. That's for sure. Yes? Gentrification. Gentrification. Tell me about that. Uh, well, uh, it's going to be a plus and a minus. Uh, it's going to be positive because, as you stated in the resources, we're going to have an opportunity to revamp some uh, cities, some uh, places. But also, uh, a lot of them are going to go like ghost towns. It's mm -hmm. going to be unused spaces, unused resources. So we're going to have to reconfigure how to do their risk allocation mechanism. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. Yes, the I mean, if you think about the, the, the global demand for space will decrease. Uh, right now, we're at about 8 billion people around the world. The expectation is about around uh, 2080. That'll be around uh, about 10 billion. Um, that's where we th that so so we think uh, that's where we max out. Uh, again, looking at current demographic trends, um, and so the question is, once that starts to, to go down, uh, then what do we do? We've seen that happen with certain cities having just decline in population. So fair point. Yes. Oh, and by the way, uh, a new rule, which is uh, give us your name and where you're from, uh, okay. so we all because we all want to we all want to know you. Yeah. My name is K. Wall. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I would say, okay, the COVID gave us a taste of what it, what an economic slowdown feels like. <laughs> when you have fewer and fewer people, you're going to have a, basically a permanent reduction in GDP across the board. That, I think, will, it, the, the multiplier effect will cause so much more damage, I think, to the way we do business, the way we mm -hmm. value things. Yeah. Um, that people, I don't think, are paying attention to it. Okay. So potentially just, again, smaller consumer base, so smaller, le less need for actual real estate, which again, this is what I think about a lot. But beyond real estate, of course, is, is the need for all the goods and services we produce. Uh, yes? Mark from Toronto. Um, I think the, the, the current infrastructure that was built in place is, is not prepared for that, the, the need of a larger elder population. So there have to be some changes in the cities to accommodate that. So, Mark, that's an excellent, excellent point, which is that we, our cities themselves are built um, for a different population. Uh, again, this is one of the things Japan is, is because they're struggling, because Japan is, is faced with this, um, they're actually reconfiguring. One of the, we're, we'll talk about one of the cities in Japan, which is just has kind of closed in in order to rethink its infrastructure. So to accommodate, again, people who uh, have different mobility needs, uh, but will be around for a very long time. Uh, yes? Tony Askin, Wayland, Massachusetts. As you said earlier, where you live affects how much you make, um, how long you live, what kind of education you get. This is an average. Mm -hmm. In this country, zip codes make a difference. Zip and codes, so yeah. The gap between haves and have-nots are going to grow. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the, the question of uh, can we, you know, we've, this is a, we're, we're in an exceptional generation. Uh, can this be the generation with our, with our ingenuity and our passion uh, to close that gap so that it doesn't, it's not where you happen to be born that determines what opportunities you have? Um, an, a, an aspiration a, a worthy, I think, of this group for sure. Yes? Pressure in terms of government 
Yeah, so, okay, so the t uh, taxation, uh, that's important. So we have public services. We have two things happening. First and foremost is the actual, the tax base is, uh, it may potentially be shrinking. Uh, at the same time that the services that are required or requested from the government are increasing. Uh, in the United States, we are experiencing that with Social Security. We have been kind of barreling down that insolvency for a very long time. Uh, that's an absolutely fair point. So, and we, we see that at the, at the city level as well. All right, couple, couple more, and then we're going to talk about the good stuff. Again, I was, I don't want to, that's, a, I hope the power doesn't go out and we have to leave and everyone just says, man, that was great going to Harvard. The wor <laughs> world's going to, to get in, in down the toilet. All right, yes. Uh, so, Gerard, Chicago, Illinois. Um, even though we are looking at a lot of the questions or, or, or the insights have been given to a close proximity in the time series, Urban development and design with the advent of next level technologies are going to actually have a massive fluctuation from an exponential growth capability to a massive reduction. So a lot of the cities that are being advocated around the world as next level smart cities and whatnot, like Neon, for example, in South Beach, in KSA, um, we are going to experience a new level of agile urban development, financial planning, as well as real estate allocation. Mm -hmm. So that is personally something that I'm concerned with in my field, working in next generation, ethical artificial intelligence, ethical digital transformation. How can I adapt to create augmented intelligence with the economic pressures of this massive dislocations mm. on birth replacements, on population growth, the empowerment of exponential growth as a mathematical concept to exponential reduction. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge. Yeah, again, again, this is a. Uh, uh, there's a lot there, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's these are the things. This is why I, when I say it keeps me up at night, uh, I keep me, I keep thinking about what what opportunities and what challenges. Uh, let's talk about the opportunities. Uh, I appreciate you kind of transitioning us out of there. Let's talk about the opportunities. Um, and and the for those who are in the uh, in the in the Zoom uh, place, feel free to to to. to uh, post your suggestions in the chat. Um, so what are the opportunities? We've seen some stresses. Uh, what we're talking about is decrease in space usage, uh, an infrastructure which will still be in place long after the current needs are, 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 are relevant to that space. Uh, we're talking about tax base. Uh, we're talking about this idea of who's, gonna, who's going to, to help uh, since we don't have this, we have a smaller generation uh, on which this pyramid is now being built. Um, what are the opportunities? What do you guys see? Yes. We'll do one, then two. Yes. I'm Spencer, a region for Canada, now in Charlotte with that. In representing sustainability, I want to say that what this does is it reduces all kinds of problems we're having right now. One, we're going to temperature 3.6 by 2100. We're about 7 million people dying a year of pollution. We have got issues for growth. So, so if we reduce the GDP, if we reduce the population, we will actually, more people will live in the end. So my concern is we are, this presentation looking at population decrease as a bad thing, and to not be honest, it would be our goal. It would be our way to save the Earth, mm -hmm. is one thing. We would potentially hit the half Earth that Wilson is trying to produce by reducing our footprint, by not growing our communities, by, by keeping them tight. And so I, I personally see it as a benefit, the drop in population. Sure, there's a question of just carrying capacity uh, of the planet. And so, so, so giving, giving that carrying capacity a bit of a break uh, would certainly, I can, I can see the advantage there. Let me do this one, and then we have an online uh, feedback. Yes? Ahmad Ali uh, from Oakville, Ontario. Um, so one of the opportunities is as seniors are living longer, <coughs> the services for seniors, uh, like senior care, and even uh, you know applications for seniors, like I was, my last class that I did uh, last year was a UX engineering course in which we had to design an application for people who are over the age of 80 uh, just because of their cognitive decline and how they just need a simpler type of user interface. What type of uh, you know, apps can they be using to help them to do their normal daily stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge opportunity there. There's not a lot of apps out there for those type of demographics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's great. Yes. Uh, the, I mean, wonderful, wonderful point. Uh, new industries being born. Uh, absolutely. And this question of this is going to be a real challenge, uh, which again is where, in, in my opinion, uh, why I'm so proud to be part of the Extension School is because we have this diverse group. So much of our technology, think about it. Picture, uh, I just want you to imagine, uh, if I say IT companies, you know, IT startup in San Francisco, right? What do you picture? Right? A lot of young people. Right? And young people have a lot of energy. But if you're trying to design something for someone who is 80 years old or 90 years old, having that insight into what their lived experience is, that's important. I think we all understand that, that, that no one person can truly understand the lived experience of everyone. Um, having a more collaborative enterprise, I think, is certainly uh, worthy, again, of our, of our goal. Uh, yes, we had a, a, an online comment. Yes, Nader on Zoom says, artificial intelligence taking away some of the clerical tasks could be a good thing to make up for skills shortages. Mm -hmm. It's a fair point. So uh, now this gets, get, it's our question of resource uh, utilization, which is um, on the one hand, uh, we, you know, we'll be utilizing fewer resources. On the other hand, productivity can go way up. Uh, right now, again, it's very easy, again, speaking of uh, thinking in, in terms of the lived experience we're most familiar with, um, the, the level of consumption that, uh, especially the United States, that we, uh, that we experience in terms of the, just the, the sheer volume of stuff that we buy and that we use and we eat uh, is, is far from uniform. Uh, and, and that is it's worth noting. Uh, there, is, uh, there are billions of people around the world who would uh, be delighted to have the level of consumption that we experience here. Uh, again, evening that out, um, certainly something we can be thinking about. Um, only because there's so much to talk about, and we started actually talking about artificial intelligence, um, I, wanna, I wanna move on uh, because that is the next major thing for us to be thinking about. But before, uh, before we, we, we transition to that, um, let's talk about uh, some of the, the, the huge benefits. And by the way, um, uh, uh, Peter Linneman and, and Dr. Rosen have, have put together a great, great read on this. So again, if I uh, there's no test, but if I were to assign a, a book on this, um, this would certainly be one of them, The Great Age Reboot. Um, so one of the things we note is consumer preferences are changing. Uh, again, again uh, in, in history, we have not seen such a significant shift. Uh, the consumer uh, power is increasingly shifting to older female adults. It's worth noting, again, some statistics for you. Western Europe, uh, the people who are over 60s will account for about 60% of the growth in consumption between now, this is 2022 is when this came out, and 2030. Right? This one group are driving the changes in consumption. So for those of you who are thinking about markets to go into, this is a extremely underserved marketplace. And it will change the things that we buy. By 2050, this is, again, crucial for us to be thinking about. By 2050, 26% of the population will be 70 or older. Right? It's only 11% today. So we're talking about a quarter. One in four people will be uh, over, uh, over the age of 70. Less than 30% of the population will be below the age of 30. Right? Again, I mean, we've just, in the, in the course of human history, we've never seen anything like this, and it's going to happen. It's happening now. We, we know how many people are on the planet. We know what their ages are. This is happening. And it's just worth noting that there will be then that shift. The consumption desires of those over 70 will absolutely swamp those under 30. By the way, it's also worth noting, again, those over 70 will likely have more resources. So it's not just that there are more of them, but they will be using their savings they've accumulated over 70 years, as opposed to the consumption decisions of uh, people who have only been saving, hopefully if they have been saving, for a couple of years. So things to be thinking about uh, in terms of product focus, again, we're, we're already there. Uh, it is just, it is fascinating to see before our eyes how things are changing. Um, uh, a, a, a common consumer staple, uh, diapers, right? Baby diapers, by the way, uh, as I'll share a little bit later on, I have an 11 week old. Um, so I fall in this category of buying a lot of baby diapers. In Japan, they sell more adult diapers than baby diapers, right? Far more. In the United States, in 2026, we'll be reaching this tipping point. In 2026, the United States, will be, we will sell more adult diapers than we will, we, than we will baby diapers. Uh, sunglasses or glass eyewear. 
So sunglasses, again, uh, the, in, in terms of, uh, again, uh, an issue or a, a, a change that's happened in Japan, which is now uh, going to come in the United States, uh, no question, they sell more eyeglasses or, or reading glasses than they do sunglasses. Right? It's a changing shift in the stuff that we buy. How we make it, where we make it, and, and what we make is going to change rapidly over the next several years. Uh, one of the key things, uh, and we're, we're just talking again, what wonderful point that you made about designing uh, things for, uh, you know, for an older generation, uh, is we have to understand that older generation. So there is an absolute catastrophic failure uh, in, in, in a lot of marketing and, pro and product development groups in terms of understanding what it means to be uh, 65 and older. Um, for a lot of people, this is kind of the image, right? What does it mean to be 65 and older, right? For anyone who's 65 and older, my question to you is, does this at all resemble what your lived experience is? And yeah, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, this is uh, the, the 65 and older crowd um, has, has been absolutely booming in terms of going out uh, and experiencing this world. So, so this is absolutely true. Uh, there's a group. Uh, so there's a group of, of uh, the, the phrase, they, this is their phrase, not mine, rapping grannies uh, that, are, that are going around in China uh, right now. And, and again, by the way, uh, if, for what it's worth, this, we could do a whole lecture on this. Um, uh, men, watch out. Because <laughs> there has been throughout history kind of a, well, a, a, what I'll call a significant built-in bias uh, in terms of economic you know, power that has just, uh, for, for a lot of structural reasons in history, has been towards men. Uh, Th that, this generation, that is over. Uh, and so consequently, that's where we see a lot of marriages being over uh, because of the, the economic freedom and liberty of people saying, hey, I, I don't need this, uh, I don't need you, I'm heading out on the road. Uh, so, so we're seeing this more and more. Uh, and, and so again, you see, you see women that are living longer, enjoying more economic freedom, uh, and, and they are absolutely taking advantage of it. Uh, but uh, that's not to say that there isn't a place for, for, for men uh, in the older. This is a, this is a this, he has millions of, of followers Followers, uh, this guy. So he does his own kind of karaoke, and people, uh, you know, uh, people tune in. Um, this is one of those things where, again, what I want to go back to is to realize um, that that whole retirement age thing. It may be that people step away from the workforce as we traditionally understand it, uh, but there is so much activity that is happening. And so, again, to the extent that we foster and cater that uh, as 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 a community, um, not only are we, of course, uh, making it available for for when we're in that age, uh, but also also ensuring that that valuable part of our population continues uh, to thrive. Uh, this is something that, that manufacturers are thinking about. BMW completely uh, rebuilt a whole plant with older workers in mind. Uh, what did they realize? They realized that it was far less expensive to redesign and rebuild a plant to make it easier for older workers to stay than it was to continuously train younger workers only to lose on the other end their most valuable experienced employees. Uh, and so they, th they got thinking about this. They said, what, is it? what are the things that, we're, that we need in our plant? How do, we, uh, how do we make it easier for someone to stand in one place or better still, give them an opportunity to sit while they are working? Um, how do we think about uh, adding more lights and, and adding, uh, adding, adding more uh, safety measures so that people can, can keep working in safety if they choose? So this is an absolute economic boom. Uh, and that's the thing that I want to leave you guys with. Uh, the, uh, again, I don't want to bum you out earlier thinking about the challenges. There are challenges. And just as we talk about technology in a couple minutes, uh, there will be challenges to that as well. But what we're seeing is that people are living longer, healthier lives. Right? And, and what we know is that the later you are in your career, the more productive you are. Uh, we just we just know that from being around. You've got uh, that you've got decades of experience under your belt. You've got that human capital, the connections. You've been through multiple careers, so you can bring that that knowledge and that insight into that the new career that you're in. So. These are very these are these are highly productive people that that uh, that we get to see. So it's again it's not just that people are living longer. It's that we as a planet has have this opportunity, this resource that we can put to work. And by the way, that, that work is very, very valuable. Uh, so we think about the idea of just adding one more workday per worker, and this is in the United States, about 124 million current workers. What if you could extend just for one day 
th those workers, put them in place, allow them to work one more day than they otherwise would have. Right? It's about a $90 billion swing. Right? That's just one more day's worth of work. And the key thing to think about that is imagine if you could extend that productive use, not for, for, for one day, but for five years, or for 10 years, or for 20 years. This is the key thing we're thinking about. So uh, what I want you to be thinking about in, in, in terms of our cities is our cities have to adapt to this. Our universities, and again, I'm, this is one of the reasons I'm so proud to be part of the Extension School, is it is adapting to this. It's making that the, the education that we, that we all need uh, to be refreshed from, from time to time making that available so that we can continue to, uh, to thrive. Uh, in terms of our cities, um, this, you know, we still are building these uh, kind of McMansions that was really, really big in the 90s. Uh, we're still building them, but the bottom line is, is that they're, as, as people age, uh, they're looking to age in place, aging in a place that allows them to maintain independence, again, in their healthy lives, uh, and, 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 but also uh, a place of culture. Uh, the, one of the reasons we see university towns booming right now, uh, it's because, of course, we have a lot of students, it's also because we have a lot of retirees that are moved to university towns uh, so that they can be plugged back into the vibrant educational community uh, and be exposed to new ideas. Uh, so we see a lot of that. And again, as we mentioned, there are cities that are being remade thinking about that aging population uh, to attract that group. So, Let's talk real quick before we, before we transition uh, in terms of thinking about uh, you know, what, I want, what I want you guys to take away from this talk. Uh, first and foremost is uh, life expectancy is rising. Uh, that's the uh, healthcare quality is improving exponentially. And again, there's only, we only see this, this, this going further for us. Uh, birth rates are continuing to fall. The challenges that we're seeing will be real. Uh, so again, we, we, can't, we can't shy away from that. But overall, there's more opportunity than there are challenges. Uh, in terms of thinking about what you might want to do in the future, uh, first and foremost is look to those products uh, that older consumers, uh, products and services that older consumers will be excited to buy. Um, so if you're thinking about your future, keep in mind your consumer, especially you know, by 2030, uh, don't be surprised if your primary consumer is female and over 65. Right? It's, a, it's the biggest by far, and that will drive consumption decisions. Uh, retain your older workers. Uh, again, for those of you who are in, in leadership positions, and, and many of you are, and certainly if you're not yet, you will be, think about how you can retain those older workers uh, because that is an unbelievable resource. That accumulated human capital is, is, is irreplaceable. And if you can put it to use, you can do a lot of good with it. So how do you do that? Uh, flexibility, that's gonna be very, very important. Uh, flexible in terms of how people work, when they work. Uh, a key thing is, of course, thinking about mentoring and reverse mentoring. Uh, again, a critical part we're seeing a lot of companies doing right now is that reverse mentoring. Uh, and that, that, again, that strengthens the bond. Uh, the, one of the saddest things that we can think of is when someone you know, goes to retirement and they're just excited to leave, right? And what a terrible idea. Most retirements now are a very bittersweet experience of so people who are saying, I'm stepping away. Um, but that transitioning away is something we're seeing more and more. And then, of course, uh, embracing technology. Um, these are things to be thinking about. Before the year 1800, no country in the world had an average expectancy of birth beyond 40 years. Right? That was 1800. That wasn't that long ago. There was not a country in the world where the life expectancy at birth was beyond 40 years. Today, there is no country in the world where the life expectancy is less than 40 years. So we are living an incredible time. What we do with that time and what we do with that resources will shape the future. And this generation that you are a part of, this time that you are in, will be that pivotal moment where we look back and see what we did with this incredible boon we had. Let's take a short break. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, just, a, a, just a, 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 a biology break for those who need it. Uh, it is, uh, we'll, do a, we'll do about 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back. Uh, and then what we're going to talk about when we get back is this idea of what is going on in the world of, of real estate, what's going on with technology. We've got things like digital toilet seats that I want to tell you about, uh, and, also, uh, and also little pills we can swallow that monitor your insides. We're going to talk about all of that when we get back in 10 minutes. I'll see you guys then.
Okay. So if you can hear me clap once. You can hear me clap twice. Okay, can you let me clap three times? All right, you weren't listening, but you were clapping. I like that. This is, this is I was gonna say, this is, uh, this is multitasking. It's something that we, that uh, an extension school student specialty. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, with, with the next uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, I wanna talk to you again about the, 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 the second thing that keeps me awake at night. So uh, longevity is, is crucial, uh, and it is, against, it is the background against everything that we do uh, should be measured in terms of thinking about how that, that trend for the first time in human history is going to, uh, to change. But there's a lot else that's happening the first time in human history, uh, and it has to do with technology. First and foremost, it's worth noting that when we think about uh, the world, uh, the world is enormous. The asset pool that's out there, and what we're talking about here is if, if, if someone uh, from, a, from another civilization, uh, another space-faring civilization came and offered to buy the planet Earth, uh, the question is um, how much would we sell it for, right? How much is this planet worth? What's the total value of all the assets in the world? Uh, of course, we know that there's lots of stocks and bonds that are out there. Uh, that's about $110 trillion of all, the, of all the stocks, the equities in the world. In terms of debt, so we're talking about bonds, uh, a, a significant chunk, $123 trillion is the total amount of, of bonds that are out there. Uh, the world produces a lot every year. Uh, so if you take a snapshot of, of the world's production, uh, GDP about $84 trillion. That's how much stuff that we produce in a given year. And then of course you can think about things like commodities uh, such as gold, for example. Gold uh, accounts for about $12 trillion worth of value. So this is the, the uh, half of what the world is worth. What's the other half? I said, you know, it's, it's actually a fair point. Someone said human capital, but we're probably not going to sell everyone to the aliens. Uh, but what we will do is we, still, we will sell the real estate. That's the other half. Half of the total investable assets of the world is real estate. That's one of the things I love about real estate. It is the most ubiquitous and it is the largest asset class in the world. Uh, commercial real estate, about 32, 33 trillion dollars. Uh, agricultural land, about 35 trillion dollars. And of course, my personal favorite, residential real estate. Residential real estate in the whole world is about 258 trillion dollars, right? Half of the world's assets are in real estate. Uh, the reason that's important for us to think about is because when we think about the technology that I'm gonna be talking to you about, the changes that we're seeing, um, there's this whole asset class which largely has missed out on a lot of technology. It is in this generation that technology is making its way into real estate. So there's a lot of exciting things to think about there. Uh, but before we do that, again, uh, to, 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 to quantify this, um, it's important to think about the size of things. Uh, for those, again, for those who have been in my classes, you guys know, uh, I think a lot about scale. Uh, we just did earlier before, we, th we started thinking about uh, the, the power of exponential growth. But let's, again, think about size. Uh, so if we're talking about $258 trillion, what does that mean for us? Well, uh, one way to put that in perspective is to, is to put it in, in a different perspective that we can at least try to relate to, which of course is time. So if you were to count out each of those seconds, uh, each of those, those dollars, uh, $1 per second, um, how long would it take us to count out that number? Well, again, uh, whether you're involved in real estate or, or any other pursuit, it's important that you know these scales because we throw around numbers like millions and billions and sometimes we think of the same thing. They are not. How long does it take us to count? If by, by uh, one second at a time to get to 1,000 seconds, if you were guys to do that, uh, you could do it in about 17 minutes. Right? So that's a manageable thing. Right? I mean, you'd have to focus for a bit, but uh, one second at a time, it'd take you about 17 minutes to count out $1,000. How long would it take if we brought in a million dollar bills for you to count them out one second at a time? What do we think? A year. A year, right? 50 years. You'll get, a, you'll get it closer than that, although we will take a long time. Uh, in this case, one million seconds, again, one second at a time. Uh, 
about 12 days, right? So not, so we're not, we're not a year yet. But that's a that's a significant jump. If I were to tell you, say, go from a thousand to a million, uh, going from 17 something that takes you 17 minutes to do to something that takes you 12 days to do, that's a big jump for most of us. How about the jump? from a million to a billion. Something again, which we just sometimes we, conf we read, the, uh, read something in the newspaper and we forget whether it was a million. Do they say a million or do they say a billion? Doesn't really matter. How long does it take to get to a billion? But three years, maybe? Right? It takes about 32 years, oh right? That's how much bigger a billion is than a million. Right? And again, this is important, that scaling is important for us because so much of the decisions we make, the mental models that we use to evaluate the world around us is based on our lived experience, based on things that we have uh, walked through life and, and touched and felt. So we suddenly, when we're dealing, as your generation is doing, with numbers and scales which are beyond our ordinary lived experience, it's very easy for us to lose sight of just how big the world that we're looking to uh, interact with is. So uh, to get to a billion seconds, 32 years. By the way, notice we're not even at a trillion yet, right? How long would it take to count out a trillion dollars? If I brought in a trillion dollars and left it right here, right, part of Harvard's endowment, <laughs> and you guys were counting it out, right? <laughs> It's about 32,000 years, right? About 32,000 years. That's how long it takes. So by the way, when we're talking about the federal deficit, right, and we're thinking about things like or the federal budget, the debt limit at 32 or you know, 30, roughly 32 trillion dollars, right? We're talking some serious, serious numbers here. By the way, for the total amount, if you were to count out, if the aliens came and said, we're paying in one dollar bills uh, for all of the world's real estate, it would take you about 10.4 million years to, to count that out. That's how much real estate there is. And it's one of the things that I'm, again, of course I'm biased here, but one of the things I'm so excited about is it's such a huge market. It's a market that we can all participate in and it's big enough that the decisions that we make, the way that we introduce technology into it, can make a big difference. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about prop tech, uh, which is just property tech, obviously. Uh, but the key thing is we actually have it. It's if you define prop tech, no matter where you go, you're going to get slightly different definitions. Uh, what I would just say is it, the, the best way to kind of break it out is first and foremost into smart real estate. So that's the way in which we operate our assets. The next major way we think about uh, prop tech, uh, things that we need to be, be aware of in terms of real estate, is how we use it. So shared resources, so the shared or collaborative economy. Uh, so it's the use of real estate, not just how we operate it and manage it, but how we use it. Uh, then, of course, we're going to talk about uh, fintech. Uh, so we're going to be talking about why it is that real estate companies are analyzing uh, what's going down your toilet uh, and measuring your, what's going on in your neighborhood based on all of that. Uh, fintech uh, is, is a major part of that. So it's ownership of assets. How do we, how do we measure value of, of spaces? Um, how do we uh, exchange those assets? And then, of course, uh, construction tech. Uh, so lots of aspirations, uh, lots of major failures in that, uh, in that, in that realm. Uh, but these are the four categories to be thinking about. And within all of these, when we think about these different, uh, these different uh, areas of, of prop tech, what we're learning is uh, they're, they're largely derivative of things that have happened in other industries. So we see, you guys will see it. Those of you who are not in real estate, you'll see this first, and then you'll see how it translates into the world of real estate. So what's driving it? What's driving this change? Well, a couple things. First and foremost is uh, aging population. Again, it's totally changing our needs for real estate space. So some really, really exciting uh, technologies I want to share with you and just get you thinking about. Uh, another key thing is rapid urbanization. Uh, this is one of the major changes that, we, that we've just talked about. Uh, the World Bank suggests that 56% of the population currently lives in cities. And that's going to double, that percentage is, is going to, or the population of, of urban cities is going to, uh, uh, urban population is going to double uh, by 2050. 70% uh, of the population we expect by 2050 is going to live in a city of some kind. Cities are machines for global production. 80% of what we produce, the value of what we produce, GDP, generated in cities. 
And so it matters to us how our cities are constructed. It matters how we use technology to leverage the productivity of the cities and the people that are in them. I mentioned maturing external technologies. Again, this is one of those things, uh, again, I, I love real estate, but there's a lot of places where uh, the technology is maturing elsewhere and suddenly coming into the real estate world. Uh, proof of concept has been achieved and we begin to adopt. So what we're talking about with those, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit, uh, sensors and the Internet of Things. Uh, I've got some of my favorite devices. I want to I want to crowdsource from you guys the, the devices I'm missing, uh, not just for my presentation, but I mean for my personal life. <laughs> Uh, machine learning and AI, again, is revolutionizing what we can do with our cities, how we plan our space and how we move about that space. And then, of course, uh, data digitalization. Uh, this is one of those things that, for those of you who are in the computer science end of, the, of, our, of our education spectrum, um, it's worth noting that somewhere between uh, 80 to 90 percent of all the information that we have in this world, the bits that we, that we measure information with, is unstructured. Right? It's unsearchable. We have it. We just don't know uh, how to access it. With machine learning and AI, we're starting to be able to access that. Take that information and make it usable. So let's talk about the, the Internet of Things. Uh, this is one of those things where, again, I just, I, 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 I can't tell you how excited I am to be in the world of real estate now in terms of the things that we have available to us. Um, so this has been around really 2010 is when this really came into its own. Um, but, uh, but you will recognize some of these. Uh, how many of you guys have a, have a thermostat you control with your phone? Right? Yeah, we, 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 we got that. Uh, it's a, by the way, so now it's a digital argument in terms of turning up or down the heat. Um, so we're controlling our heats. Again, it's huge. Uh, buildings uh, take up about 30% of the, en the energy consumption of buildings takes up at least 30% of the overall energy usage. Uh, depending on where you are, that's up to 60%. So being able to monitor that uh, digitally uh, helps us preserve and ex extend the energy that we have. Uh, of course, again, we are monitoring everything now. Security has been a big thing. Again, if you think about especially aging population, security is really, really important. Uh, so again, I, 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 I can attest to this. I went over to my mom's house and installed a bunch of this stuff. And so, uh, so now, by the way, she uses it all the time. Like, I'll be walking up to the front door, and she'll start talking to me through her doorbell. Um, so. <laughs> So anyway, uh, again, uh, this goes back to the fact that, that uh, they may, may not adopt uh, early, but when they do, right, people adopt uh, fully. And that's an important thing to be thinking about. Uh, uh, actually, j just used this uh, yesterday. Uh, so now, uh, for, for checking in for, for uh, hotels, uh, it's just it's all on our phone. So uh, again, that makes things a lot faster in terms of being able to get to your hotel room and check out. Um, but this also works in terms of the shared economy. So the idea of, of you don't have to uh, leave a key under your mat. Um, just give your friend access to your house, and they can go over uh, for dog walkers, for visitors, um, and for, uh, for guests. Uh, in terms of fun things that we're seeing, uh, more and more, I'm excited about this one, is the digital refrigerator. Uh, uh, the key thing is, uh, and again, I, I, I really, this speaks to me, uh, because not only does it, of course, keep track of, of what you have in your food, uh, in your refrigerator, uh, it also will let you know uh, if something is spoiling and it's, you, you need to get that out of your fridge. Uh, also, uh, there's actually this, like the digital camera thing that says, hey, um, here's what you've got, here's what you need. Right? How many of you have gone to the store and you forget whether or not you actually need to get milk? Right? Here we can actually check in, live stream, on your, on your t uh, assuming, of course, you've stacked things well. Um, but but you know, this, is, this is, is indicative of a trend which is going on, which is uh, this Internet of Things is happening in all parts of our lives. There's hardly a, an area or a device or a thing that we interact with that can't somehow become a little bit better with technology. Again, it's scary how much it's, it's taking over our world. But if you think about quality of life, uh, there's a lot to it. Uh, our houses uh, everywhere, we're now becoming uh, totally digital. That is to say uh, that there are devices everywhere that connect to each other. Again, a major security risk that we have to consider. 
but also an opportunity in terms of sustainability. Uh, because when we think about uh, our power generation, again, right now, we are just really, really bad at generating power. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the carbon impact of the power we generate uh, is substantial. Uh, but our homes are becoming more and more uh, these 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 little power facilities. Uh, so, for example, you have you can actually we can now do the thing where you have solar panels that then power your electric car uh, and then pull from the grid when you need. Right? Our homes, the the very infrastructure of the world around us is becoming part of this digital empire that we are a part of. Uh, there are all sorts of things. Someone's really excited about this one. I am too. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to admit, I have this. I absolutely have this. Uh, this is a, uh, it's electric dog feeder, uh, right? So, so it's got a little camera. By the way, it works just this way. Uh, gizmo, uh, for when I'm traveling or when, uh, when, when my wife and I are traveling, uh, we actually, we will have this out if we're out, if we're out for the day. Uh, we'll have Gizmo and we can talk to him. And, uh, and of course, we have multiple cameras in the house, so we follow him everywhere. Uh, I'm sure he'd be terrified to know that. Um, <laughs> But, but all these, these little things that, uh, that, that, that make our lives easier, and some of them, uh, admittedly, may be a little extraneous, right? This may be a little bit over the top, but these little things that keep us connected and make our lives a little bit easier. Um, there are some things, though, which are beyond the convenient. These are things which are changing the landscape for us. And so uh, that, of course, uh, the, the latest, uh, which all of you are a part of right now, we are at that, that part that people say that we're in the, the fourth industrial uh, revolution is kind of the way to think about this. Uh, another way to think about this is that the, uh, I, I heard recently, uh, AI is, is, is about as important as the invention of fire. Um, I can see that. Uh, I can see that from, from just from the world that I see in real estate, uh, much less a lot of the world that all of you occupy in different uh, non-real estate worlds. So let's talk about AI uh, and let's talk about what it's changing. First and foremost is for the longest time, uh, I say longest time, I mean the last 15 years or so, um, we've, we've been getting used to machine learning, right? This has been around. Uh, and the idea is, is that we take, uh, we take structured data and we set algorithms onto that data, and that, of course, allows uh, some meaning to be drawn out of that data. And that has been very powerful. Uh, we've done a lot with machine learning that has helped us really understand our cities. There's a, there's a group at MIT that has uh, looked at images like this and looked at the, the question of how green are our cities uh, and how does that affect value. So they went through Google Street View and, and looked at uh, around New York to determine how much greenage there is to try to understand whether that affects property values. Right, a question which was unimaginable for us to answer before, we now have an answer to. And that information helps us make better decisions. So machine learning has been around for a while. That's been helpful for us. Uh, artificial intelligence is a whole different creature. Uh, and we're seeing that more and more. Uh, and again, it's one of those things that we're, we could, I could do a whole talk just on this. Um, but in terms of thinking about uh, how this helps and, and how, this, how we practically use it, chat G, uh, GPT, uh, love it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a user. I think I hopefully many of you are. If you haven't yet, uh, jump on board, if, if for nothing else, just to have some fun. Um, but there are, 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 as much as we kind of can have it write a, you know, a poem for us uh, or, uh, or tell us a joke, um, the actual on the ground implications of having the, this, this powerful technology at our disposal uh, are crucial. And indeed, in many cases, are life and death. So here's some technologies that we're seeing that are being put into homes. And again, one of the key things is you want, I want to match this with that idea of longevity uh, in terms of people living longer, living independently. Uh, one of the things uh, they developed at MIT is, is human radar, right? Oddly enough, uh, this actually came about as a result of an experiment on Wi-Fi extension. Um, so thinking about how do you extend Wi-Fi and, and, uh, and make it throughout through the house. And one of the things they noted was that there was interference that was happening. And the interference was that people were moving around. And that kind of made them realize, well, wait a minute. Um, if we can actually use, the, just the Wi-Fi we use for our digital uh, communication um, can detect when someone's moving, what if we actually paid attention to interference? What if we studied it more closely? And indeed, uh, we now have this, uh, this, is, this is in prototypes in homes, uh, and the idea is that you can monitor someone moving around. Um, why is this helpful? Why, why do you think this would be very, very helpful, especially we're talking about an older population? False. 
right? The question is, again, uh, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I, I, I haven't tapped into my mom's, uh, the, the, the security system in her house yet. Uh, but you know, sometimes I worry, you know, I wanna make sure she's doing all right. Um, that's a little bit creepy if I look at the camera, but this will let you know if someone has fallen over. Right? Not only that, but it's not dependent on you know, someone's kid or, uh, or a friend checking in. Um, this is one of those things where we can actually see someone walking around. We can see if they suddenly stop and drop, and it can call the hospital or call the police. Right? So that's a very important thing for us. But it turns out there's even more. Right? You're excited? I'm excited. <laughs> right? There's even more we can think about which is there are a lot of degenerative illnesses that we experience over time, which if you measure someone close enough, you can catch earlier. One of the things we note is our gait, how you walk, right? That actually is one of the things, especially for, for example, dementia, it's a very early indicator. Alzheimer's, another early indicator, is how someone walks. And we don't have really time to think about you know, going in and doing a study every week to see what, how, how is your gait doing. But if you have a situation like this where it's constantly monitoring, we can actually peer in and see how someone's gait is changing over time. So are they starting to shuffle a little bit more? Might be an indicator of, of, a, of, a, of, of a degenerative illness. Uh, also, again, could also be a preamble for a stroke. So these are things we can measure now. And of course, we can use AI to diagnose that, to look at those trends. We don't have to have someone that we're paying to review your chart, but rather a constant monitoring, comparing how you're moving about your space. That little box attached to the side of a wall in someone's house allows someone to live independently. And we know that when people live independently, when they, as, 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 if they're able to live on their own, uh, they enjoy healthier, more active, and, and more fulfilled lives. Again, at some point, uh, it is, some, is appropriate to move people into assisted living if we're talking about someone who is much more advanced, but no one looks forward to that. And devices like these can help us out. They can help us monitor health and monitor safety, and all of this is something that we should be excited about. Um, this is one I was, I was mentioning. Uh, I was in Chicago yesterday uh, giving it to, to t a talk to a bunch of, uh, of physicians who are investing in real estate. Uh, and, uh, and it was very intimidating because it's a very, very smart room. Uh, and I learned about this little thing. Uh, so this, this got added uh, on, the, on, the, on the plane right here. Um, so the question is, what is this, uh, this person so excited about? Uh, she's got a little pill and a little cup of water and is just thrilled about this procedure that's about to happen. Um, what we're talking about is something called the pill cam, right? Yeah, that's what I said, right? So uh, the idea here is, is that you swallow this pill. Uh, so the, this is, uh, it's a video capsule endoscopy. So the idea is that instead of uh, actually running a camera uh, down your throat to see what's going on inside of your, inside of your gut, um, you can just take this pill and, uh, and then carry around with you, go about your day, you carry around a little, the little detector that's, just, that, that, that's next to you, and it will then do the, its own recording of what's going on inside of your gut. Right? And more impressive still, this doctor was telling about yesterday, uh, is that it's also then analyzed, again, by computer. So rather than the doctor going around and sitting there doing the procedure, which again is, uh, if you've ever had it done, it's very invasive. Uh, and then, of course, it's monitoring that as it's going. Itch. Uh, we now have the computer look at the footage and identify where it sees red, because that's what they're worried about so in this particular case, is where do we see bleeding that's happening? Right? Things like this. Uh, most people uh, will avoid, and you sh as well you should, um, having, to, having to be scoped if you can avoid it, right? But uh, a lot of that means that these health conditions uh, go undetected. If it's a matter of just taking a pill and then having uh, the little AI bot review your records and every, say, three months or six months doing that procedure, uh, we can uh, capture and prevent uh, a lot of illness. So just one example of this. Uh, another key thing, uh, I mentioned, I promised this, uh, the, the heart seat. Uh, so on the other end of this, of this spectrum. Uh, so this is, uh, this is one of those things, there are, by the way, this is not the only one, there are many uh, smart toilet seats that are out there available for you. Uh, but the thing is, if you think about it, this actually does make a lot of sense because we can gain a lot of information, um, as it turns out, from your toilet seat in your home. Uh, we can look at things like, uh, look at your weight, 
How, is, how are you doing in terms of your weight? Uh, not only that, you can also, of course, take your pulse so, and take your temperature. So that, that, that's something we can measure to see how you're doing. Uh, it's also one of those things where you can actually measure um, once someone has taken medication. Because again, it's, if, especially if you sample from the water, which again, is a, that's a whole other set of technology that we're looking to equip homes with so we can better understand how your diet is changing. Again, these are all little things, but they build up to make a difference. These are things that are keeping people alive longer and keeping people living at home longer. So uh, we can measure heart rate uh, right now, uh, oxygen level, um, all of these things um, through the magic of my blood pressure as well, um, all through the magic of your toilet seat. Um, you need not uh, install one of these uh, in your house to lead a healthier life. Again, if you, don't, if you don't want that level of monitoring, that's okay. By the way, there is one I didn't put on here. Uh, there is one that measures sound. Uh, so apparently, <laughs> so they say, uh, you can learn a lot from listening uh, at the toilet. Again, I don't, <laughs> that's a bit much for me. But there is one out there. Uh, but I mean, this affects all part of us. Uh, wearables are becoming a major thing. How many people are, have, have a Fitbit right now? Yeah, yeah, or an Apple Watch, yes, yeah, right? Uh, this is when we do our active learning weekends. We found, we found out that uh, people were taking on average about 12,000 steps when they were coming here uh, visiting properties around in the Cambridge area. Uh, so this is through, through, our, through Apple Watch and Fitbit. Um, here we have uh, wearable, uh, these, are, these, are, these are yoga pants, these are smart yoga pants. Uh, and the idea here is they give you feedback, uh, so haptic feedback as to whether or not you have, you know, you're doing crow right or you're doing warrior two correctly. Uh, these are all things which again help us understand and be more cognizant of how we interact with the world around us. And again, in the world of real estate, that matters because it helps us understand where people want to live and, and how they use their space. <laughs> Uh, speaking of using spaces, uh, occupancy sensors and predictions. Uh, that's something, again, uh, there's a difference between having the, uh, you know, the, 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 the thermostat that's on all the time uh, versus the one that you can set, uh, the one we control with our phones, and now, of course, the ones that predict when someone's going to be in a space. It lowers the temperature before people come in, and then, of course, when they leave, it allows the temperature to rise again, a much more efficient usage of our space. Uh, for buildings, it is incredible how much uh, energy we use and waste right now because we're simply not monitoring it. That building information monitoring systems that we're seeing more and more uh, and, the, and the role that AI is playing in it, huge for us. So be on the lookout for more of these as they're changing our spaces around us. Uh, and again, if you sit on a, on a toilet and starts talking to you, um, you know, give it a chance, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, in terms of other key things, so, so the, the actual smart use, uh, the collaborative economy, I, again, this is one of those things I need not tell you, is just ch absolutely changing the way that we use our space. It's empowering people to put to productive use assets which have largely been unusable. And of course, what we're talking about is, is the way that we move around, uh, the way that we stay overnight, uh, and of course, the way that we, that we uh, use spaces in, in, in the public as well. So for example, uh, autonomous vehicles, again, I'm, I'm very hopeful for this. I'm very excited about this. Uh, we've got a long way to go. I get it. But again, this is one of those things where getting around cities is an important aspect of living in them. Autonomous vehicles will allow someone who is uh, mobility constrained uh, to move around our cities and our spaces. So expect that in the cities first. We'll see that more and more. Uh, again, another key thing, uh, drone delivery. Uh, we are on our way. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there is, one of the greatest real estate plays that's happening right now is the use of gas stations. Right? We have all of these gas stations that are around the, the, the country. Uh, they are very small parcels, uh, so you can't do a whole lot with them. But we know that a lot of them are going to be vacant. Uh, they, they run about 10-year leases. So there's a huge renewal that wave just happened. There's a lot of group that are, that are buying up those leases in anticipation of converting them to something else. Last mile delivery is going to be a huge part of making our cities much more accessible and affordable. Uh, of course, uh, most people around here, uh, you, you travel around. So here, by the way, just what we're looking uh, is, is the, the number of hotels that are under management. Uh, so by far and away, uh, Marriott has the most, 1.4 million rooms under, under their roofs. Uh, Hilton, uh, which just stay out yesterday, uh, 10 mil, or 1 million. Uh, the largest, though, of course, Airbnb, right? 5.6 million rooms under management. And the interesting thing is these are rooms that are not owned, by and large, by corporations. They're owned by individuals, people who are able to put to productive use an asset they already had. 
So this gets at our part of the, the question we have about, about uh, conservation and about sustainability is making more use of what we already have. Uh, tech, shared technologies help us out with that. And these shared technologies help us around our, 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 our daily lives. So food and delivery, uh, there's all sorts of things, right? For those of you who have, uh, you, uh, I'm sure most of you have used all of these, if not in the last week, certainly probably in the last month. Right? These are ways in which we allow, again, the, the gig economy. Uh, there's this, a, a statistic for you. Uh, four out of five millennials prefer the gig economy world than the, what we'll call the, the traditional corporate world. These allow not only the convenience of getting the goods to the consumers, but also creates a whole economy for people who, are, who, who want to uh, be on the service side of it. Uh, transportation, uh, took an Uber to get uh, here yesterday, uh, late last night. Uh, but it's not just about Uber, it's about the actual, the helping of individuals. Because so, again, a lot of times, again, thinking about longevity, thinking about people living independently for an extended uh, period of, in their lives, um, need help with stuff. Boxes moved, a couch moved, uh, a, a, a picture hung. And they have these groups, uh, Alfred and TaskRabbit, uh, which are uh, available for exactly that. Right? It allows people to participate, again, in the gig economy on the service side. Uh, but you can absolutely do that. I mean, that's a, this is one of the things that we think about in terms of, of technology. These platforms that are created, connecting individuals, connecting resources with outlets for those resources. And again, it's changing the world in front of us. It's allowing us to do much more with what we have. Uh, in fintech, there is so much uh, I can talk to you about about the financial side of this. Again, this is uh, the the idea of blockchain. Uh, this is one of those those rabbit holes uh, which I, which I won't go down with you today. Uh, but I do want you to be thinking about the idea of of uh, how technology and and again AI is changing the way we understand prices and markets. Um, so there's a group, uh, Propportunity, uh, which offers loans. Uh, it's based in the UK, uh, but they're, they're one of the groups. Uh, they're one of several groups that are out there monitoring the, uh, a lot of things about neighborhoods. Uh, of course, we know things like monitoring crime rates and monitoring rents and uh, vacancy, things like that. Um, they're the ones that are monitoring the, the, the sewer lines. Um, and they're able to offer cheaper, higher, uh, loan to value loan, so bigger loans, based on their projection of how much the property is worth. Right? right now, what we know is, for those of you, anyone who's gotten a loan recently, as you know, is you go to the home or you get, you get appraisal for the, for the house, uh, and then that's what your loan is based on. They're looking at not what is, what is uh, currently in place, but what is likely to happen in the future. Uh, they're sampling, among other things, the general health of the neighborhood. Right, that's why they're doing the sewer. They're not looking at your sewer line uh, specifically. They're looking at the health of the neighborhood. By the way, no joke, uh, one of their major indicators, the quality of the cocaine in, in the sewer system. They're looking at that, uh, and they note, uh, they, they're, they're very open about this. Uh, they note that different, uh, it, it comes in different uh, qualities, and they note that if they, as the cocaine gets better, uh, the, the neighborhood is likely to, uh, to, to, gen to gentrify. Uh, and so that's something they look at, right? These are things to be thinking about. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but that's part of their, that's part of their business model. Uh, we get more and more um, of the unstructured data becoming structured. And again, this is one of those things, if I could point to you to an area where you're seeing this revolution happen in real time, uh, it is the idea of taking data which we have previously not been able to analyze and analyzing it. The big breakthrough came through, of course, when we started doing uh, image recognition. Right? That was a big thing. We, we started with optical character recognition uh, about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, we're now being able to actually recognize images, uh, facial recognition, um, recognize you know, what is a car, what is a fire hydrant, thanks to all of you guys and the little uh, the, the, the login security systems. Um, but as we get that, we get these new insights. So we're able to value properties a little bit better. And again, it's not just about investing, but it's about allocating resources. It's about getting capital to where it needs to be. Because so much of our markets are based on uh, the idea that capital won't flow to certain areas because there's lack of information. AI is helping us break down those barriers and helping us understand our cities better. And by the way, in terms of actual on the, on the, 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 the thinking about constructing and building those cities, um, it's helping there too.
So we're doing a much, much better job of, of tracking construction um, so that uh, the, you know, we do it in the digital world first, so we know uh, when, how a building's coming together, uh, when stuff needs to be delivered. Um, we, we, uh, we use digital twins now, not just to build the building. There is a, an actual digital representation of the building, but also once it's sold, selling that and providing that digital twin to the new owner. So the new owner understands how the building was built. They understand their building information uh, monitoring systems. They're able to operate it better. It helps our buildings last longer, and again, creates more value for us, more resources for the people of this planet. Uh, fabrication, we're doing a lot more of that, which is really cool. Uh, a lot of fails on this uh, off-site production. Uh, we've tried. Uh, this is one of those areas where I think we're, for those of you who are interested, uh, I think there's a long way to go in terms of building things better. Uh, but we know that it is far easier, if you can do it, to do uh, you know, electrical work or, or plumbing work, not outside in the cold, uh, for anyone who's ever had to do something in, in the, you know, the Cambridge winter, but rather uh, in a controlled environment. So we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, and that, that is saving money. Get Getting those, moving those resources is becoming harder. It's hard to move a building. We'll get there eventually. Uh, 3D printing, uh, again, continues uh, to, uh, as, as we start to, to print with different materials. That's helping us out. Um, Another key, key thing, which again, I, I, I think about all the time, is uh, there's a group called Placer AI. Uh, for, have you, how many people have heard about? Okay, they're, they're tracking your movement all the time. Uh, they, they buy cell phone data. Um, so they know, for example, they can tell a, uh, a hotel uh, how many people came to your hotel today directly from the airport. What city did they depart from to come to your hotel? If, they, if we're looking at shopping centers, they're looking at how long are people staying at your shopping center. And if they come to your shopping center and then go to another competing one, which one are they going to? That level of detail is helping us map out our cities in a way that we never have been able to before. So instead of just simply saying, here's one particular use district or, or here's another, we can actually see at different times of day how many people are, are, are moving through our cities. Where are they going? And if they didn't find what they were looking for, where did they go after that? Information we've never had at our fingertips, we now have, and we've got AI that's going to work on all that. That helps us with our neighborhoods. That helps us build out those, those better spaces for us. Um, there's a group uh, that, is, uh, that, that helps with zoning. Uh, this is View City. Um, they have an entire digital twin of the city of London. Okay, they've gone through, uh, and, and this is, uh, they've, they've looked at, so they've got 3.3 million dwellings, uh, and it, they're down the accuracy to 15 centimeters. Right, so you can go into London and see um, how will a building fit? If we're looking at proposing new development, how will that affect the neighbors that are nearby? Right? That level of granular detail. London is, just a, is, is, a, uh, is one of their, of their proof of concepts. They're now expanding around the world to understand, to document our cities, so we can do a better job of managing that resource. Also allows people to, uh, the, the population, to, uh, to be more informed, uh, more informed citizen, citizenry about our cities. So that when someone comes in, a developer comes in, and again, I'm, I'm in real estate, so I, I interact with developers a lot, um, to come in to say, look, this is what our community is looking for, and people have the ability to, to draw on data to say, this is what we want in our community. This will create a more cohesive community for us. So these are kind of the big things uh, that we think about uh, in terms of, of prop tech. Uh, it is happening around us. Uh, it is improving that world uh, in which we see that changing demographic uh, emerge. So things to be thinking about, uh, and this is uh, this is could, could almost be uh, part of the kind of the, the extension school motto in terms of thinking about how we operate, which is adopting these new ideas requires focusing on their adoption. Right, there's kind of an assumption that you just you know, hire smart people and, the, and they'll get to it. Um, we know that culture matters in real estate and culture matters in companies. And so looking directly at this and saying, how do we recruit people to be part of our groups that have this mindset, this technological mindset, to use and leverage what's available to us um, to, uh, for, our, our, uh, uh, for our enterprise? If we think about the combination of these two, uh, I think, uh, again, the, 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 the synthesis here, uh, at least I hope, will be pretty straightforward, which is that uh, we have, a, for the first time in human history, a change in our demographic, which is going to offer us, in human resources, 
an unbelievable reservoir of opportunity. We now have on the technology side something which levers that even more. So the question is, what do we do about it? Right? What do all of you do about this special place you find yourself in in human history and more particularly on the planet while you're here at Harvard? Well, a couple things. Uh, first and foremost is it's important to think about that scale and the opportunity that you have. Again, remember uh, that, that in 1800, again, there was not a single country in the world that had an average life expectancy of 40 years or, 40 years or greater uh, at that time. Uh, now, there is not a single country who has fewer than 40 years of life expectancy. So 1850 to, to 1900, pretty easy for you to think about, to chart out, chart out your life. Uh, you've got your uh, zero to, to 16 would be childhood. Uh, actually, probably be more like zero to 12 would be childhood. But we'll be charitable on that one. Uh, 17 to 40, that's your adulthood. And that's kind of it, right? <laughs> Pretty easy to plan your life out at that point. Uh, maybe enjoy some retirement. Again, 47 to uh, 49, uh, that was life expectancy. Uh, 1850 to 1900, right? Again, not that long ago. This is what we were facing. Last century, we moved up. We had some additional opportunities. So 1950 to 2000, here's kind of how you would plan your life out. Again, let's assume uh, that, that childhood extended a little bit longer. Right, we're gonna say zero to 22. Uh, that included college for many people who went to it or a, uh, a prolonged adolescence, uh, as, uh, as, we, as we will say. Uh, and then you've got this kind of early to mid-career phase, 21 to 44, right? That's when you were just, you were getting your first jobs, you were, you were getting some experience, uh, maybe in your mid-30s to late 30s, you started to get some real leadership experience. Um, that was kind of your mid-career. Uh, you then struck that, that, uh, that part where uh, con consumer companies love you to death, which is 44 to 65. You're at kind of peak earning. You've got your experience under your belt. You've got your network established. Um, you are out there producing a lot. So this kind of late career, 44 to 65. Uh, and then, of course, you have your uh, retirement, 65 and older. Um, you punch out your, your last time card, and then you head out. Uh, this, for this part, again, average lifespan is 75 to 80 years old. This is an out of date way of thinking about our life, uh, and, and, and we should be excited for that. Uh, starting in this century, we now have that, I'm going to be charitable here, still 0 to 22 childhood. <laughs> Some people might argue that might be 24 or 26. <laughs> The, the average age of marriage is now uh, around 30 years old for men, about 28, year olds, uh, for, uh, 28 uh, for women. By the way, interesting statistic for you, uh, driver's license. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for the men, and again, I'm sorry to pick on men, but we certainly have earned it. Uh, in terms of uh, average age for driver's license, uh, the average age for those who don't know in the United States to get your driver's license, you can get it 16 years old. Average age of acquisition for men, about 19 and a half to 20, right? We get, we, we pass, oh, you know, we get the opportunity and then we sit on it for about three years. Uh, for, for women, any guess? 16. 16. Bam. Opportunity is there. They move in, they take it. Yes, correct. Yeah, so again, I, I, I point to, uh, so, yeah, you got it right away at 16? Yeah. So, okay, zero to 22. Uh, you've got your childhood uh, to you know, your college. Uh, 21 to 40, we're now gonna call that early career, right? This is your first draft at your career. This is the career that you set upon when with all the knowledge uh, that you had when you were 18, you started to set that path, right? And, and again, for many people, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're very lucky, you stumbled into a career that you absolutely love doing. Uh, but for many people, uh, you'll realize by the time you're 40 that, you know what, I, I've enjoyed this, but I have developed other passions that I want to check out. There's more for me out there. There's more that I can contribute in other pastures. And so therefore, we have now a new category, 40 to 60. That's your mid-career. Notice, of course, we're not suggesting retiring at this point. And then we, of course, have, at this point, a late career. Call it 60 to 75. By the way, I'm still reluctant to put 75 as that number. 
right? Uh, when you're in full stride at 75 with that perspective and that experience and that human capital, um, and, and especially with your toilet that's talking to you and telling you about your health, <laughs> right? Uh, you can continue to tri contribute, but then we get into this idea of, of retirement, right? Uh, right now, in terms of average lifespan, again, you saw the stats, depending on where you are, unfortunately, depending on what zip code you are, uh, we're talking about 85, 90, uh, 105 years old, right? This is the kind of the world that we are in. Uh, I want to, 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 to give you a specific case in point on this. Uh, and again, these are the things that, that keep me uh, awake at night. Uh, UNESCO uh, looked at this in terms of thinking about education, um, thinking about how we, as a, as a civilization, are equipping ourselves with that knowledge. Because uh, artificial intelligence is really, really, really exciting. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you guys on that. But we have natural intelligence. And unfortunately, that natural intelligence is not being maximized in terms of the opportunity for it to be curated and developed. Uh, right now, best estimate by UNESCO is that we've got about half a billion people on the planet who have a college degree or higher. Right, half a billion out of eight. Right, we're talking about basically one in fifteen. So what about the other fourteen? What about that that resource that's available, not just from from their perspective, but for the world's perspective? Um, how do we reach that group? UNESCO uh, notes that that learning. This is their their latest report, as they were noting about thinking about our our lifetime of learning. Uh, learning is a lifetime experience. It requires quality education provision, along with flexible learning pathways. With each person's learning trajectory being unique and involving innumerable formal and informal learning experiences. Right? What they're looking at is they're thinking about that human capital that is available to us if we just reach out to it. So to, to kind of drive the point home, this is Maria Branas Morea. Uh, she is the, currently the oldest person in the world. Uh, she was born in, on March 4th, 1907 in San Francisco. That makes her, and by the way, I just updated this, uh, 16 years, two months, and seven days old. Or 116, there we go, excuse me. She's, she's in her adolescence. It was a rough 16 years. It's all that TikTok. Uh, 116 years old. Um, she, she, has been, uh, she has been experienced not one, but two global pandemics. Um, so she survived the, uh, the, the Spanish flu, which again, we know is H1N1. Uh, of course, they didn't know that at the time, but she survived that. She became the oldest person in the world to actually get COVID and recover. So, uh, so, that was, so, so she's been through a lot. Um, uh, this is one of the cool things about it. This is a picture of her in 1928. Uh, 1928. Uh, one of the things that's kind of cool about this is this would be when she was about 21 years old, the age of a typical college graduate, give or take. Right? This was the world she was in. In that world, by the way, uh, uh, here at Harvard, uh, at, uh, President uh, Lowell, uh, Abbott Lawrence Lowell was, was president, uh, founder of the Extension School. Extension School was old news, by the way, and by, that, by, 1920, uh, by 1928, uh, it was uh, 18 years old, so maybe not that old. Um, but the average uh, tuition, by the way, if she had gone to Harvard College, 300 bucks, right? <laughs> For the year, right? Uh, it's worth noting that, unfortunately, she wouldn't have been able to go to the Kennedy School. Not only, of course, that Kennedy uh, had not been to, to Harvard yet, uh, but we didn't even have a school of government. We didn't have what was uh, eventually the, the Graduate School of Public Administration hadn't been established, nor had the GSD, the Graduate School of Design. Um, but there were, if she was going into medicine, uh, there were some very, very exciting things happening. Uh, we had just developed the iron lung for polio. Right, so that so we had that. That was that was that was hot technology uh, back at during uh, back in 1928. Uh, we of course had uh, we uh, we had just rediscovered. Uh, technically, we knew it before, but penicillin had just come back. Uh, so we we understood bacterial infections at that point, and insulin had just come on the market. Nobel Prize winning discovery. That's the kind of technology. If someone were sitting there with their whatever was before a laser printer, I suppose it was a stick if I understand correctly. Um, someone who was standing in this room in, this, in Harvard Yard giving a presentation about the technology of the world would have been talking about those things. 
right? How quaint. You know, we know so much more now that we just didn't know before. All these things, those toilet seats we were talking about and those pills you can swallow with the cameras in them and the radar that can tell you how your gait is developing and, and whether or not dementia is perhaps setting in, all those things that I'm excited about that I truly think are revolutionary and are gonna change our lives, right? That's what they were saying about those technologies when she would have gone to college. So the question, of course, is what will they be saying in another 50 years, right? How much will we look back and laugh at this presentation and say, oh man, if you only knew what was out there waiting for you, right? That's something for us to be thinking about. And so it falls to us to think about the fact that uh, I hope all of you outlive in terms of number of years on this planet. Hopefully all of you outlive Maria, but, but in, in terms of, uh, she would say that too. Uh, but in terms of number of years, uh, uh, may, may all of you uh, spend more than 116 years on this planet, but may all of you not be stuck with the education that we got when we were 21 years old, right? May we all move past and come back to this place of learning and learn more, those things which just seemed fantastic, too fantastic to dream, but which became reality and then of course became mundane. Let's think about how we can make that happen. Uh, I want you to think about the idea that uh, just 20 generations ago, we would not have seen this kind of change, right? The grandchildren live very similar lives to their grandparents. And yet 10 years ago was, was totally different than, it, than, than our life, uh, our lived experiences today. What will our world look like in five years? Will it be a lot different? Remember that paper exercise we did. Remember those foldings that we saw. With each new fold, with each new layering of that knowledge that we've been building, the accumulated capital that we have been fostering, with each fold we now see more and more in the world. So my question to all of you is, what will your next act be? Right? What will that second act be? And I, I, I realize this is a very unfair question for those who are just graduating. <laughs> We're already thinking about your current act. But the day will come, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, hopefully not more than 20 years from now, when you look back at the things we talked about and the things we marveled at and you said, we have done that, now there's something new. What will that act be? What will your life look like? Another thing in terms of, of thinking about that that 60 year uh, curriculum that you've heard as part of the Extension School. We were at the, for, again, one of the reasons I'm so proud to be at the Extension School, one of the reasons I find meaning and richness in this work is that we are part of that. Uh, we didn't need to be told that the world was changing. The Extension School back in, when it was established in 1910, was a reflection of that change. It is in our DNA to seek more knowledge, to come back as a group, uh, as both as instructors and as learners, to come back together and figure out how we can do it better in the future. In terms of the things that keep me up at night, uh, I will just end with this, uh, and then for those who have questions, we can hang out afterwards, but otherwise you guys can, uh, you guys can, can head out uh, into Harvard Yard. Um, the things that keep me up at night uh, are the opportunities that are around us every day and how we're taking advantage of those opportunities, how we're leveraging the world, not just for ourselves, for what we have right now, but for the world of those who come after us. And this has, for those of you who don't know, uh, become very, very real for me uh, very recently. Um, this, is, this is little Apollo. Uh, for those of you, thank you. I, uh, uh, I, I can't take full credit for this. <laughs> uh, he was born on March 1st. Uh, this is my first, uh, my first child. Uh, we're very, I feel very, very lucky. Uh, my, my life has been full of, of good fortune and good luck. Uh, and, and this certainly is, is one of those. So this is him uh, just after he was born. Uh, I, I asked him, what's your next act? And he, he, <laughs> he promptly spit up on me. But. Um, um, but uh, he was born, by the way, during midterms. No kidding. Uh, supposed to come during spring break. Came during midterms. Um, 
One of the things I certainly experienced was uh, I was, of course, teaching classes at that time. Uh, I spent a lot of my life uh, at, at the Extension School. Uh, and one of the things I've always said is that I get as much back from my time here, um, from being immersed and surrounded by students like you um, that, that are both, uh, both students and teachers. Um, I learned a lot this semester. I got so much advice from people who had been there before me, who students who shared with me uh, their experiences, who, who, who consoled me when I was struggling out. Uh, I was surrounded, as all of you are in this world of, of, of our, of our close-knit community at Harvard, I was immediately surrounded by a network of people who got it, who were interested in, 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 in the experience that we all go through together uh, and going through it with, with me. Uh, I have to tell you, it was one of the most touching and humbling experiences to go through uh, to be part of this community. Um, I hope for all of you that you continue to be, uh, to immerse yourself in this group, because when something big like this happens, uh, you'll be glad that you're surrounded by this incredible network. Um, I have certainly, when I said what's his next act, um, I, was, I was serious about it. Uh, here he was with our, some of our favorite real estate textbooks. Um, so I think he's, he's, he's working his way through. So a little lullaby and all of that. Um, the, uh, yes, that's a great question. The great question is what, so the, so the question is, is, is where, where does he end up? And again, in a way that I, you know, being part of this Harvard community, you can't help but wonder and marvel at the future. It's something I spend a lot of time thinking about Never more so than when Apollo came along. I started thinking about the future. I started thinking about what his first act will be. And I will put you on notice that uh, we are getting ready to submit an application. So, 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 so Dean Coleman, uh, for the class of 2045, we have your first applicant. <laughs> I hope this will be his first act. I know we're, so, we're not supposed to pressure him. I know. I, I, be, be, people told me. But as a parent, uh, I can tell you with, with all of my, with my being, with all of my, start, with my soul and my heart, I hope he finds a community like we have here at Harvard. I hope it is here. I hope his first act is when he is in 2025, uh, 40 years after I first stepped foot on Harvard's campus, I hope he takes that step. I hope he takes that step because this has always been a special place. It's a place we can come back to time after time after time and find a community of learners and teachers who believe passionately about our place in this world and what we can do for future generations. So I hope he is the class of 20, uh, 2045, your first applicant. And I'll say one more thing, which is if any of this talk that I've mentioned have, has, has, has kind of got me thinking about my act, um, perhaps my second act will be along with him. So I have not one application, but two applications for the class of 2045. Uh, I plan on, on staying here as an instructor and a learner as part of this community. I welcome all of you who have just for the first time going to be joining this in, uh, in your seal. And for all of you who are coming back, uh, please continue to come back. It is a wonderful, wonderful community. And without you, of course, uh, it is less. With you, it is immeasurably more. Thank you all for your time. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you. Oh, my goodness. Amazing. Teo, I just want to take a moment from our school and our association just to thank you once again. Teo is a gift to this school, and we are a gift to each other. So take his words of advice and come back, support each other, and take his optimism into the future, because if I could bottle it, I would. So thank you, thank Teo. You. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, appreciate it. And I know. I know you're all probably very hungry, but I would love to invite you to the steps of Widener for a group photo before we head over to lunch. Thank you. So anyone interested, your family as well, you're all Harvard family, guests, come on in this photo. Thank you. <laughs>